being here today here at the Keystone. Shout out to BXKC for making this all happen. Again, if you did not hear already, my name is Lexi, a.k.a. Lisa's, a.k.a. Holy Lex from the Radical Alignment Podcast. Um, I have some wonderful panelists here. I'm actually going to allow them to introduce themselves just because I can really not do them justice. Um, luckily, we all have a long list of things that we like to do. And I think that you guys would do well by introducing yourselves. So I'm going to start with you first, Aisha. Thank you, Lexi. I'm really excited to be here um, and talk about representation fatigue in the workplace. My name is Dr. Aisha Gustaparam. I am an oppression relief healer. My background is in counseling psychology. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of CEPO, which is a technology-based business designed to help organizations mitigate instances of discrimination in the workplace. I also work individually with, um, with people who've experienced racial trauma. I'm really passionate about that particular work because I believe, and we'll talk about this hopefully um, tonight, but I personally believe that racial trauma is um, one of the underlining pinnings of most mental health issues, especially for um, African Americans here in America. Every system that we interact with is designed um, to oppress us. And so that causes a lot of, of uh, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, um, sometimes sometimes suicidal ideation. So my work is really passionate to me, um, um, super um, involved in the social justice avenues related to mental health and um, the way that we show up as black people here in America. So super excited to be here. Um, so my name is Abdul Rashid Jahaya. Uh, I'm best known for my background in video games. Um, I'm a Kansas City native. Uh, about nine years ago, I started a company by the name of Local Legends. It's a video game truck um, that we host casual competitive gaming events as well as birthday party for a lot of kids. Uh, that's really what Kansas City knows me for. But that's where I got my start in entrepreneurship, which moved my, my professional title to serial entrepreneur. So I, over the last nine years, have sold and acquired quite a few different gaming companies, built out event spaces and gaming arenas, um, and hosted some of the largest uh, gaming competitions across the nation. Um, since then, I've kind of transitioned into, laterally into other industries from nightlife and entertainment, as well as uh, the cannabis industry with products and services. Um, so I'll be speaking from a couple of different avenues of uh, breaking these barriers and getting into these industries, as well as what I still deal with day to day, um, being in the extra industry. Um, from a perspective, I'm a Kansas City native, so I'm gonna talk to you guys just like we're in our backyard. Um, I am fortunate and blessed that uh, I get to do what I love and I get to talk to you all from that perspective as well. Sharing is caring. It is. Well, depending on what it is. Kind of. You're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dr. Ashley Owen. And like Dr. AP, um, I'm very interested and passionate about social justice. Uh, my background is in public health. I have served three different administrations, um, presidents of the United States, and I more recently retired in the past year. Um, so now I get to pursue my entrepreneurship full time and other passion projects, which are mostly centered around health and wellness in the black community. Um, but other communities of color as well. Uh, people tell me my expertise is uh, maternal and child health, um, but it's hard uh, when I've spent half of my career uh, working with the military and the defense industry. Um, when it comes to Kansas City, I'm originally from here. I moved back about a year ago from being in DC for a very long time. So um, it is very interesting to see um, how professionals function here. Uh, in corporate America, in the startup space, uh, in comparison to how it was back in DC. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight to share all of my experiences and viewpoints with you all. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so I am quite an interactive person, so I'm not expecting y'all to like fully participate, but if you wanna make eye contact with me and nod a little bit or shake your head a little bit, that will definitely keep the blood pumping tonight, all right, y'all? So. Um, does everybody is everybody pretty much familiar with what representation fatigue actually is like not really okay okay look y'all gonna participate oh, yeah yeah i like that i like not not and shake your head that's all i need okay cool so i'll break it down for you just a little bit so basically 
what I would classify representation representation fatigue it, it as is basically um, being one um, tokenization a little bit. So I'd say um, feeling the need to um, represent everybody within the diaspora within your specific culture um in space in spaces of business and corporate spaces of work um not always it doesn't necessarily always have to be a corporate space but i feel like the majority of us who have ever been in that space um can definitely empathize with um well there aren't many of me here people who look like me here so um I feel like I'm going to have to overcompensate and speak for my entire race um, in this space. Um, so a little bit of tokenization within that space um, and feeling like you have to, um, I'd say, I'd say minimize your actual feelings or like suppress your actual feelings in the name of like keeping things like um, keeping things neutral and peaceful at work. If that's, if that's, um, making sense there before I go too in too many circles but I only have three questions tonight um I'm gonna have you guys answer just in whatever order that you prefer but I only have three questions tonight um we did have a focus group I actually had the pleasure of meeting two of you guys um me and Abdul we've known each other for a while but two of you guys I have um got a chance to meet you at a focus group where we did talk a lot about this and so a lot of those questions are going to stem from that so the first question I have is have you ever felt limited or deprived of your individualism as a result of tokenization? Well, all right. Uh, the answer to Take that- Take your time, yeah. The answer to that question is absolutely. Um, as I said, I, I've worked in a space uh, with the military and defense, and uh, just like many other spaces in corporate America, it's all white men and me. And um, in my last organization, there were five people of color. So I was walking down the hall one day and I saw a new black person and I was so excited. Um, I almost came out of my work self because I saw, I was like, hey sis. And then I thought about where I was. So I'm used to sitting in a space with a whole bunch of people that do not look like me um, that are decades older than me as well and um i have that feeling constantly constantly in my career yeah it's very much given that color purple you know, like type of <laughs> i see you from afar i don't really see a whole lot of people like that look like me in this space so and also i feel like it's also hard to differentiate like um i feel like the easiest way for me to say that is like are you are you are you black black or like just regular black I don't, you know what i'm saying and, and yeah. are you skin yeah. folk or kin folk or mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that's the biggest thing so mm -hmm. you know as we looked at each other and you lock eyes kind of like awkward black girl when Issa ray did the yes thing about walking down the hall and but we locked eyes and she looked at me longer and i looked at her longer and we both had dreads and i was like oh <laughs> like the closer we got i knew like i felt an energy that she yeah. was there with me so yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that, um, Dr. Ashley. I think I think absolutely the answer is yes. And I think um, it comes from us being like conditioned to represent our entire race wherever we step into a room. So I've been told you're so articulate um, or, you know, you you I bet your community is really proud of you. You know, so all of these little jabs and these little statements over time make it feel like it's our responsibility every time we walk anywhere to represent our entire race. Um, everywhere we go. That's a massive amount of pressure for us to carry um, in every, you know, work environment that we, that we move into. And most other um, ethnicities don't have that, that responsibility. I even found myself putting that on my kids whenever we went into the grocery store. Like, girl, you, you know, come on, y'all got to, y'all got to act right. Don't touch nothing because you're representing your entire race. Um, a couple years ago, I went out on this, <laughs> I tell Lexi about this all the time, I sought out on this journey for myself to rid my, my entire life as well as my family's um, of every aspect of the false notion of white supremacy in our entire lives. And I'm still on that journey, it's a lot of work, um, but I had to start a, examining these, you know, these lies and this, um, the pressure that, that we've placed on ourselves and that society has placed on us as well. So I think tokenism is, is something that's really important to talk about because if, if we're not careful, we'll be in the beginning really happy to be tokenized. We're like, well, yeah, I want to, 
like everybody like me here. You know, they want they want me to go to this meeting. They want me to be on this board or on this committee um, until we realize, oh, you're doing that because I'm the only black person here. And these are great ops, you know, for pictures and social media and also to to let other organizations know that they are doing it right here. They're really um they're really taking diversity serious. So I think it's really important is some internal work that we have to do to recognize like, do you, do we want to be tokenized? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and what does tokenism do to us? Um, how does it impact our, um, our self-concept? How does that impact um, our community? Um, and is that even something that we can actually do represent, you know, our entire race? And when we agree to that, even subconsciously, how we're doing a disservice for those who are coming behind us. Before you answer, Abdul, I know that you have we share we actually share a background in information technology. And um, I, I do want you to answer the question just as you normally would. But also, like specifically, what what are some other impacts that you see um, that could be a problem specifically in the space of information technology? Yeah. So although I, I'm in the esports industry now, my background is in I.T. So I worked in I.T. for 12 years before I took my leap of faith into entrepreneurship. Um, I've worked for companies from Apple to VML before they had the Y&R on their title, um, Qwit, Power, Lexmark, all huge companies, billion dollar companies across the Kansas City. And I had, I've for many years been token blackie who gets to run out to the minority desk and uh, fix the person before you fix the problem to make sure that uh, someone who looks like them, sounds like them can um, assimilate in the area and make them feel comfortable before you provide a solution. Um, and I've uh took the the gift and the curse that comes along with it um being the black person in the industry can get you into a lot of doors because they have a need for us to fill quotas but you also um become that ambassador of your race and i'm very blacky black black so you can take it i like that <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah you take it um with strides um if you give me a mic i'm gonna talk um and at every chance i get uh, so in the it industry it was it's been great um I've definitely had some times where I've had some one-on-ones with managers where they pulled up some scripts um, and they wanted my vernacular to be a little different when I'm, when I'm addressing our people. And I'm like, I can only speak to people. I meet people where they're at and I speak to them to their understanding. Um, it may not seem uh, uh, acceptable to you because you don't understand it. And if you did understand it, I wouldn't be in this place, which is the, which is the reality. Um, it can be soul sucking. Um, I'm, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, I have been blessed enough to create three black kids with a beautiful black woman and I have a black mother. So like changing who I am is very hard. I don't really know anything else. The only time I was in a space that where I had to be uh, different was when I went to college. I came out of Hickman Mill School District, Ruskin, class of 06, and I did my undergrad at K-State, which is a complete flip. Um, but I ended up joining a black fraternity. So it was right back to what I knew. Your uh, hand naturally did you know, that. It just, it just, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> no, it's great. Like, it's great. Yeah, it just a blackity black time. Yeah. <laughs> Fifteen years later, it just happens. Um, but yeah, it's a gift and a curse. But even into the into the gaming industry, um, there are only about five highly successful minorities in the esports industry. We all know each other. Um, some of us are brothers, and some of us are brothers' brothers. Um, so we always find each other at every event. The events are colossal. We mean tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people fill in arenas. We, st we still always find each other, or the people will make sure that we find each other. Um, the esports industry, the industry that was created for uh, white and Asian men to be successful. Um, and they created a barrier of entry based off of the, the price of technology that kept minorities out for many, many years. But the reality is the minority dollar is exceptionally valuable. So now uh, that they're trying to bring that barrier down and they're reaching back out to us, black and brown, um, Afro-Latino individuals in the industry to use us as tokens to reel us in um, and get us to, to not actually think that we're just being used for our dollar, which we are. Um, so I get that same privilege of being the same blackity black black person in these spaces. And I'm, I just talk my stuff while- uh, This is a safe space. Okay, great. <laughs> I just talk my stuff while we're, uh, well, right, and it makes us feel comfortable. There are individuals in this room that come from my industry too that I have those exact same uh, relationships with based off of where we come from. Yeah, I wanted to speak to that. You just made a really good point as far as the black dollar specifically is concerned. Um, 
I feel like we're really counted out in a lot of places, but I think where the culture is changing or the our methodology for fitting in and existing in these spaces is changing because of that specific reason. For example, um, through the podcast, we have a wellness club um, and we want to create opportunities for black people, some specifically black women to take up different spaces within like just health and wellness, like just trying. So trying new things like so yoga, we have a spin class that we've done a couple of times um, at a predominantly white uh, spin studio. Um, after our first event, I want to say we sold out within three days um, of that event. Um, it was a safe space where we could listen to music that we're used to. We're spinning on beat, like, you know, they're all of the places. These are things that matter. Like that, I feel like at Mojo, like that's their saying, like we, we, we ride to the beat. Like we're, you know, like we're here to do it on beat and um, you don't get to, I, but I know a lot of women um, specifically who like enter those spaces. They're not really feeling okay not being that great at something at first so like creating the safe space to where we can exist and just try some new things without feeling like we have to be the best in the room but also um after the event um was a success and whatnot i think uh, like a light bulb went on to that specific studio saying like oh we didn't know y'all like this you know uh we didn't know y'all like this so um i feel like I'd use that as an example to to say that do you feel like the culture is changing? I know that this ain't the question I share with y'all, but like <laughs> this is like a little backup question. Do you think the culture is changing specifically only because they see a need to profit off of black bodies only because um I would say in um I feel like most black millennials, my tagline for my podcast is awkward adulting for the modern millennials. So that's, I'm speaking from that perspective, but for most black millennials, I feel like, you know, it was go to college, get a job, put your head down, blend in, don't rock the boat. Don't tell people how you really feel, suppress parts of yourself and parts of the things that you go through on the daily, on a day-to-day -day basis in order to maintain or survive your work environment. So could any of you guys speak to that specific culture change um as to where now literally diversity and equity and inclusion um departments are being created with a purpose at a lot of companies despite the government trying to reel those things in um we we, we don't have time for that but despite the government trying to reel those things in um do you see do you have you found challenges adjusting from the survival mode of i need to keep my job i have to keep the majority happy versus now should I feel comfortable speaking up or, or, or how do you guys navigate that? Take your time. I, I love that question. I think um, I remember when Juneteenth first got passed as a federal holiday, there were so many companies jumping on board to start advertising. You remember all those ice cream? Oh my God. It was like, <laughs> it was so interesting and annoying, like all at the same time. And I think, um, in grad school, I, I took a Malcolm X class and it talked about the duality between capitalism and racism. And like that always needs to be brought up in these conversations that we're having because as you said, like now we're being utilized for our dollar, right? So that's another form of, of usage and, it, and it's still a lack of valuing the personhood of our people. I mean, so that's something to think about as well. Um, but, you know, some would say it's progress because we're getting, you know, now we're moving into the advertising and marketing place in a way that we haven't been able to. Um, so there's some progression, some forward progression there. But, at, you know, at what cost? Um, if, if we remember, the Juneteenth holiday came as a result of the um, the public outcry because of the death and the killing of George Floyd. Right. So so we have to like really think about like what is being placated in front of us, what is being um, you know, fed to us as a way of silencing our outcries. Um, so it's, it's a lot of stuff to really think about. It's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, is inclusivity like really, the, is the direction of inclusivity moving towards true progress or is it just moving towards um, you know, increasing the numbers or uh, meeting the quotas? And that's something that we're going to have to, you know, like really address and really think about. To your second point about um, representation fatigue, I, I think that's a really big deal. And I and I and I I provide the advice that I took myself. I told my job when because I was the first black consultant hired at this one firm. 
Um, and it was a lot of pressure on me as the first black um, person to, to be hired here in all of history. <clears throat> there was a lot of pressure put on me of like, all right, we know we have some issues and they would always be like, Aisha, what can we do? And my response was pay me and I can help you fix all these things. Cha-ching. But right now, <laughs> but right now I'm working more than, you know, than everyone else. And I'm still being forced to identify the problems because they didn't know what, what are our problems, Aisha or you know, Dr. AP, what are our problems? I, so I need to identify them and I had to come up with the solutions. And I was just in a place where um, as as a as a counselor and training and you know psychologically trained and all of that I did it very very sweet and kind but I was just in a place in my life where I was like why am I coming up with solutions to a problem I did not create I did not create all these systems to oppress people who look like me Um, this is something that you all need to come up with you all need to put in that labor that mental um, fatigue I'm gonna take this off my shoulders and you all need to carry that and you need to come up with the solutions because what I what will happen is that I'll I'll labor for so long coming up with these solutions and then they'll come back and tell me how they can't implement any of them so then I've just did all that work for nothing um, so that's a really great point. And, and I think that that's a place where I see people moving towards recognizing that the work that we're being asked to do because of our experience and the color of our skin needs to be compensated. So. I agree. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, I, I guess the one negative thing I'm going to say is you, uh, you, you spoke about them placating in response to something negative that has happened, our outcry, our out. Um, outburst about anything essentially and I would say yes we are making progress I can turn on the television and see me as a woman I can see me as a black woman I can see me as a disabled black woman on television and sometimes in the workplace Um, which by the way I'm a walking EEO nightmare right you have to imagine that in a workplace I've had to sue organizations um, because of the experience that I've had the things that they've done or not done um, in response to my needs there. And so I, I think we're, we're making some progress, but I also feel like a lot of times it's a show. So of course I've worked for our federal government, the same people that you said are trying to pull back um, any mention of any training towards um, anything that's going to rumble this systemic monster, um, like you said, that oppresses our people. I am glad that we now have chief diversity officers or diversity and inclusion specialists in essentially any company. If you can think it up, they have or are hiring for a diversity specialist, which is great, but they're only doing it because it's the sexy thing to do right now. I love the way you said that. (laughs) I'm being realistic about it. And I don't want to poo poo on these ideas. Um, but I was watching uh, a clip from the news and KCPD has their first full-time LGBTQ liaison for the community. And I'm like, oh, okay, you're doing that because it's, like I said, sexy right now. You had no interest in doing these things before. Um, people that identify a certain way or people that you know are a certain race or ethnicity, we've been around. Y'all just have not decided to do anything about it, but there's a lot of pressure coming from every angle currently that they're like oh we can make more money if we include these people we employ these people and make them take pictures with us in the company you know photo so i know what i said is like yeah we're making progress but it's trash for real if i'm being honest no and i appreciate honesty like that's what we appreciate the most out of anything how about you abdul um, so I like to speak from like another hat that I get to wear. Um, so I, I've been fortunate that I've, get to, I've gotten to be an owner as well as a consumer in a lot of spaces in uh, one of my newest ventures in nightlife entertainment. Um, so in the last year and a half, I acquired a brand called EXP Bar. Um, it is a restaurant. It was lit out there. It's a good time yeah, for sure. It um, it's a restaurant bar and nightclub that we stationed in Overland Park, Kansas. We're off 119th and Metcalf in the Rosanna Square Shopping Center. Um, Four, four billion bar district. Mine was right in the middle. Um, we were a place where minorities could authentically be themselves, um, and we stood to it. We didn't care who came through the door. Um, you were gonna hear the, the baby and make the sound. 
because you can listen to Garth Brooks anywhere else in Kansas City. But for here, for the folks who are tired of being in the West Poor, tired of being uh, downtown <clears throat> in the crossroads, they can come to Overland Park where you know nothing's going to nothing's gonna happen. Um, and we can still authentically be ourselves. You can come out and brunch with your girls, drink a mimosa, but you can also stand on a chair and dance with your friends here. Um, and every day you're going to make it home safely. So we have stable furniture in this establishment. Premium, premium furniture. Love that. But we put it in, we put it in, in Overland Park because the, the, the most popular bar districts, we just got sick of dealing with the systemic racism that's right there. Um, like even if you go to Westport, instead of let's, let's go from a thousand squ uh, square foot view to right in front of our face since we're here in Kansas City. If you go to the Westport, a lot of us, we've become cattle and we just go where we are used to go, used to going. Cattle is a good word. I, yeah. I, yeah. Um, but we don't Interesting realize word, how we are being stared to be with our people because we are not desired to be in different places. So look at bars, for example. If we go out Saturday night, you're going to find all the black people in Bridgers. You're going to find all the Hispanic people in Lotus. You're going to find all the white people in Yard Bar. All of those bars are owned by the exact same person. They're all white people that own these places. But they, are, they, they have moved us to, the exact, to, to these places because this is where they want us. They want us around our people because they know how to tailor to our people and police our people in, in that space. Um, and, then, and then Westport as a whole, they, they set up uh, guards at the end of the, the street, so it feels like we're in a concentration camp. But we still go in there, click our little heels together, and have a good time, despite how we want to be, how we desire to be treated. We fall into it week over week over week. And they love it because they want our dollar. We go in there, we buy sections, we buy bottles, we buy drinks, we buy food week over week. Um, so I've been fortunate that I get to sit on the owner side as well as be on the consumer side. Cause I'm, I've been a consumer too. I know exactly where to go if I want to see my people and have a good time. Um, but it's exhausting on the owner side because I don't want to be the person who has to curate this week over week. I have 26 employees, 18 of them are women, uh, eight of them are mothers. The rest, of the, the, the rest of my employees are men. They're usually security for their brawn that comes along with it. But this is a place where you're served, you're greeted by, by black people, you're greeted by, you're served by black people. You have a good time with black people. It's what's needed, but it's exhausting because we kind of- Having to be like the only one. Yeah. Well, not the only one, but right in, one right of the few, the yeah. Um, and then I, have to, I still take the brunt force of all of the nonsense that I deal with having owners that don't look like me of the actual building, working on getting licensing for these buildings from people who don't look like me, um, and uh, having uh, organized policing come out and deal with us in a manner because they don't look like me. Um, but it gets exhausting because I have to deal with this, so y'all don't have to deal with it. So you guys can still casually have a good time um, without having to worry about the nonsense. And then when I do turn around and have a good time, or try to go out and have a good time, we go to these places. Um, so it is completely exhausting. I grew my hair out like this because when I first started my, my entrepreneurship journey, I was so stressed out my hair fell out. And it, when it finally grew back, grew back, I was like, hell no, I'm not cutting this shit. This shit is, it is staying. Keeping it, I'm not playing yeah. with y'all. It was stress-induced alopecia. Um, it sucks, y'all. But uh, we do have to have these sort of conversations because without the awareness, we will continue to be cattle and continue to deal with the stuff and there is no change. And then the change makers of, of the... Uh, of the city get burnt out. Y'all answering these questions with y'all with y'all chest, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned. Um, I'm gonna quote the local book pusher here: um, "The illusion of freedom, like when, or the illusion of choice." So it's like you go to Westport and you have these options, but it's like, do you really have options, or like you said, are you just going to where you're expected to go? And I say it all the time that Black people are not a monolith. Um, but unfortunately, in places like Kansas City, where the population isn't as high, we're kind of all grouped, cattle into one, like we're kind of grouped into one, like they like to listen to only this kind of music. They they you know, the dress codes are um, tailored to a specific demographic of people like just all of the things. Right. And um, I don't think that's really fair. And so I could see how the you could have fatigue when you're one of few places um, and organizations who do what you do. So I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, I'm gonna hop to my second question. Um, I'm gonna share like a little mini little anecdote real quick. Um, 
at the focus group that I went to, bless his heart, I'm not going to say no names, but like I, um, you know, I ex- had expressed interest in doing diversity and inclusion work um, just as I was kind of just taking my career journey, things of that nature. Um, matter of fact, when I first met Abdul, it was my first job. I was a technical recruiter at this company and it was the first year that they had ever done any type of diversity and inclusion work that this is like they made a dude who had been there a black dude who had been there 20 years the director of diversity and inclusion and they just were like build the department right so um I'm, I'm bringing it back to the focus group so when i was talking about just my interest in joining um a, a de and i organization or somehow um transitioning into that type of a role one of the first things that a person who does not look like me asked me was well, well what are you certified in And this is a person who is working, who does work in diversity and inclusion. Bless his heart, love him to death. But like as a black woman being asked by a white male what my qualifications are in the space of diversity and inclusion felt crazy to me. Just a little bit. It was a little crazy. Meanwhile, the reason I brought up my first role, just first fresh out of college, As they're building a diversity and inclusion department, the only qualification that I needed in that space was my blackness. They was like, oh, she black. (laughs) Get her in these DE&I meetings or they didn't. It wasn't equity at the time. It was just D&I. Like, so get her in these diversity and inclusion meetings, figure out how we can recruit more people that look like her. And again, not not pay me extra for it. Um, So. My question is, how do we accommodate allyship in spaces of diversity while ensuring that persons of color are represented in the sector of the organization created for them? And I can repeat that if necessary. I know that these are some long questions, but I I, I was trying to be real specific, but I can say it again. I love that question. (laughs) You got it. Run it, run it. Um, I'll speak from my experience. I think allyship is incredibly important. And, um, and I I think it's, it's really important to kind of identify what is the goal of the DNI committee or, you know, initiative that you're working at. Um, And I think it's, it's also really important to note that in some organizations, white women use the DNI initiative or committee as a way for them to finally get some power over the white male. And so when that is the case, I think it's really important to um, to make sure that, that that's not ha- taking place and that that's not the goal of DNI. And so to make sure that everyone feels included um, and, you know, depending on the environment. I know in my situation, when I was working on an initiative, I want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable talking. So if you're a white male, then we, you know, we, I want you to be at the table. I want you to pull up a chair. I want you to speak and tell us your perspective. Um, because you, you have something to say as well. You have a different perspective, you know, than everyone else. Um, we, I'm gonna check you, you know, if you come talking crazy, but I want you to feel like this is an organization or this is an initiative or a committee that you should be a part of, right? Research says that they're the ones who are least likely to be involved. Um, so I think that's really important is making sure that white men, um, feel the, the need to get involved, um, so that they can see that they have a place at the table. It's important for everyone to be involved. Um, and also that, no other groups are trying to, you know, berate or gang up on, you know, any other group. There's no infighting um, within that. But I think also allyship, there's a lot of education that needs to take place within allyship. As I mentioned before, like making sure that there's boundaries, that people feel safe. So, yes, we want everyone to come up to the table, but we also want to make sure that we're not causing any harm um, so that there's a, a safe place so that progress can be made. So I think that's really important. But allyship, like 100 percent, we're not we don't do this work with, you know, alone. This should be led, um, in my opinion, primarily by um, by non-African-American people, by 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 the groups of people that have not been historically underrepresented. I think they need to take up the work um, and 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 take up that burden uh, more so than those who have been historically underrepresented. Because while we're at the table trying to do that work as a black woman, I'm also dealing with the day to day microaggressions. Um, When I was starting my my company, SIPO, I was doing some research and it blew my mind because black people on average experience five instances of discrimination every single day, y'all. So if I go to work and the DEI initiative meeting is at 12, I might have had three already. 
So then I'm coming into this meeting and now carrying all this weight, even though I've just had these experiences. Someone's just said something about my hair. Um, you know, I was put over the, you know, on my way to work by the police officer, whatever the cases were, whatever those five acts are halfway throughout my day, I experienced half of them. So I need to lean on the allies within that an initiative to carry some of that. I myself am still getting attacked at this moment. Um, so I think that that's really important and um, and should be stressed the importance of having individuals who don't look like me and who um, carry some type of privilege to come alongside as we do this work together. Do you need me to? Oh, no, it's, oh, yeah. it's fine. Um, I, I'll start by saying I think allyship is important. What you described, Dr. AP, is one of those things where when I look at allies, I am disappointed because nobody heard me say whatever it is my statement was. But an ally comes along, and let's just say it's a white woman. And she's like, well, this is important. And now everybody's on board. And I'm like, oh, so my voice literally means nothing here. But as soon as my colleague says it, it's the bee's knees. Y'all need to hear that sigh. <laughs> so I do value allyship. I am also disappointed in the way that people choose to embody being an ally because it's not for you necessarily to elevate what I've said or what I've done. I need y'all to acknowledge that anyway. What I need the allies to do, and us as well, but what I need the allies to do is that internal work where you realize there is value to whomever is different from you, whether that's a gender identity, race, ethnicity, neurodiversity, whatever it is. I need them to understand within themselves what their bias is and what value is being held in all of their colleagues. I think one of, you know, that kind of work is what really moves organizations. And when people don't invest in that internal work, I don't care if you want to call yourself an ally or not. You're not doing anything for me. You're not making my life easier and you're not changing the system at all. So. Sorry if that was kind of like no, a No, that was great. That was great, yeah. That's how I feel about allyship. Very important, but it's the method in which it's approached. I feel like we're um, like ghostwriting allyship. You know, like, you know, have like a ghostwriter for the allyship in that way. Like, I, because I, I experienced that with the last company that I just recently left. I was like, wow, no one cares what I have to say until it's someone else's idea who does not look like me. And, ah. That is so true. That happened. How 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 does one navigate that? Um, because it's like, yeah, the if the seed was planted in someone else, okay, great. That will somehow induce the progress, but I still don't get any, I guess, recognition for inciting said progress. I'm glad you said that. I'm I'm sorry. But the way that you address that is that you call it out. I a hundred percent. Like I'm realizing I'm just I'm just I'm just saying your shirt is green if it's green. Like that's just what we're doing. We in that space, that's what we're doing right now. And so the same thing happened to me. I'm like, every time I say something, everybody quiet. And so I just said it to them. I'm like, I don't really, I don't feel like there's a voice, I don't feel like there's a place for me in this initiative. And I use this example. And it, you know, of course, they always want like hardcore examples on this particular day. Let me pull out my book. Um, and so I gave them some of these examples and and I just had to call them on their behavior because you're exactly right. I'll say this. Everybody's quiet. Ten minutes later, so and so says it, and they're like, "That's such a fantastic idea." And you're like, "Really? Like you just gonna erase me in my face? Like you just you you playing in my face like that?" So I just I just started calling them on it, and I think and I think that's the way to go about it. And I and I think, <laughs> um. I think I, I had to look to my white sisters and I just started taking cues. Like, I'm like, let me see how they bring us stuff. Okay, they get all quiet. They get all soft-spoken. And and I had to, like, use that as a tool. It's like code switching. I'm like, let me let me use that, tech, that technique because when I come with my strength, you know, it's aggressive or it's a threat. So let me use this tool that I've seen them use. And then I'll say this very, very hard thing in a very soft way. And it gets the job done. Can I just say this real quick? And Abdul, I, to, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm basking. I got a doctor on my right, a doctor on my left. This is just black excellence. So go ahead, take your time. I appreciate that you brought up the fact of calling people out. And 
I was explaining to someone the other day, when it comes to issues like this, I choose violence. Like I wake up and I choose violence. I like it's, that. It's hundred <laughs> percent. Thank you. Standing ovation. And it's not one of those, no, I'm not coming out, you know, with M16s and shooting up the road. What I mean is, for instance, the director of my entire organization at the time uh, sent out a picture and he was smiling and cheesing in front of a sign for the Mason Dixon line. Now, my spirit was, you know, unnerved. And if y'all don't know, the Mason Dixon line is a very clear indicator on that side of the nation um, for North and South, meaning free and enslaved. So I was hurt. I was like, okay, well, it's, it's bad enough there are only five of us in this entire organization, but you would like us to see how proud you are to be at this historical place. My people aren't that happy about this. So I flat out just called him a racist. I was like, the fact that you are so deaf, tone deaf to this, that you're blind to what you're putting out there. And he's like, well, I didn't know. And none of your other black colleagues said anything. Interesting. Interesting. So um, to sit down with him and, you know, the conversation that ensued was wild. But the point is, like you said, to call it out and come to find out there were plenty of people that were uncomfortable. It was not just the black people. It was not just women. It was not just white people or, you know, we have one person that identifies as Hispanic there. So it wasn't just a one. There were several people that felt that this was inappropriate. But if I had not said anything, they too would have just sat in their offices and been like, oh, well, this is inappropriate. He no longer works there, just so y'all know. Choose violence. That's all I'm saying. Choose it. A little violence makes things happen, if I, in my opinion. Did you have anything up to order? No pressure, because that was also still a good segue until kind of my final question. But you look like you got something to say. What's on your mind, brother? Yeah, uh, from an E-Fourth industry, there, there are no allies. Um, that aren't rooted in trauma. So I said again, like in the esports industry, there are no allies that are not rooted in trauma. The esports industry is owned by white men and Asian men. Everyone else is, is by themselves. The only pseudo created allies are going to be minorities in the LGBTQ community, two uh, communities that are pushed in, that are subclasses and pushed off and are only utilized when their wallet is out. We're only valued when our wallet is out. So like, again, Look into the camera. we are only valued when our wallet is out. And for me, I gracefully took, took a step out of the esports industry in the perfect timing and it went into entertainment because I started to see all of the, the tycoons um, build their empire and then watch their foundation burn out b below them. Every esports company in the in the nation that is not supported by a by a software or platform is crashing and burning because they they built up an industry that that they put a barrier that was a two thousand plus dollar PC to to qualify yourself as a this is a professional setup and say hey this is what you need to have it where they and they did this to keep black and brown people out because if you look around what's hooked up to your TV at home is a 250 to 500 dollar playstation xbox nintendo switch i am a 35 year old man and i did not own my first uh competition grade pc until i was 28 i'm college educated i've had plenty of jobs i made a real a really nice healthy amount of money in my time um and i couldn't afford it to now my kids ain't got them um and i have access to all these publishers i'm like no we're, we're not i'm not gonna spend my money on that um but now all these companies have built their empire so high uh that they're still one of the minority dollar and we weren't equipped with the tools. Esports is like g golf and tennis. You can't be good at golf and tennis if you can't afford to play golf and tennis. So if you can't, if you don't have the tools, you're never going to be great at it. Um, so th there are no allies. You'll, you'll, you'll get online, you'll see a charity stream that, that the benefactors are uh, women in esports or, uh, or one of the not for profit 501 C, 501 C3 or C4 organizations or uh, a LG, LGBTQ plus community. Uh, it's the only time that they get behind that they get behind these uh, these communities and they donate a percentage of the proceeds. It's never 100 percent. It's always a percentage of the proceeds. They still utilize these ally groups as marketing campaigns. You, you Google now um, 
uh, each, uh, minorities in esports, you're going to find some Black Lives Matter marketing campaign. If you look up what's going on um, in Pride Month, you're going to see some rainbow uh, branded logo. And then they're going to find their token, um, their token minority or their token, um, what is even the professional term for a gay person um, that is uh, in there to come and be their ambassador. They're going to fall into that same bullshit experience that, that Bud Light is going through nationally right now. Um, because it's not what the, the masses want, want to support. It's what they need to support to pay their bills. There, there are no allies. And I'll call out any company. Because um, I've worked and acquired and sold so many of them. So I gratefully took my step out. Like, hey, y'all go burn by yourself. Like, you guys seen that meme where that dog is in the middle of the room and, like, the room yes. is on fire around them? That was me. Yes. Hanging out. Sipping a daiquiri. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and step about this one. my favorite meme. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is crazy. Like, like y'all really didn't want to rock with us. Yeah. But look at y'all. I'm on fire. I'm going to go ahead and just go hang out over here and watch y'all crash and burn. Ooh. I'll spare y'all the Nipsey quote, but he did. He did. He did predict this. But anyway, going to go ahead and slide into my final question real quick. Um, doctors on the stage for sure helped me slide into that question. Um, I know you said, Dr. Dr. Ashley, basically how you were experiencing this issue on your workplace, but like not a lot of other black people were speaking up. And Dr. AP very much an advocate for speaking up, choosing violence. We got action oriented women on the stage. But. I feel like, um, and I'm bringing this up because shout out to Jen Lynn. She's one of my friends, black friends who works in HR. And one of the roadblocks that she encounters is, I guess, finding the language to describe what you are going through. So I say, I think I say that to say that a lot of, um, black folks in, um, these spaces either A, don't have the language to describe what is actually happening to them. Um, all they can really say is, well, I was uncomfortable um, and B they don't have, I don't want to say the courage, but I mean, at, from operating in survival mode and just wondering, you know what I'm saying? If, am I going to have a job next week? If I speak up on this, um, which I've been in situations where me speaking up on something has negatively impacted my situation at work. Like they don't, they don't speak up just for, for self-preservation reasons. Right. So, um, I haven't necessarily seen it with a ton of people who are kind of my age. Some of the things that I've seen um, in this space are kind of like with, from the older generation, people who have been with these companies for years and years and years and years, 20 plus years. And um, one of the things we talked about on the focus group was that um, it's hard to pull other people who look like yourself up in certain scenarios because when you've been tokenized for so long and you've been the only black face for so long it's kind of like you've now assimilated into that culture and so anything outside of that you're kind of fearful of or scared of so the question is how do you feel that the internalized racism um, sometimes upheld by persons of color can impact an organization and what are some ways that we can combat that safe space <laughs> The most vague answer there is, and I apologize in advance, is a lot of times we get in our own way. We have become the hardest group to actually support by our own. So, what do you mean? So we are a group of individuals. We are the most talented, most brightest, most skilled, um, most creative individuals ever, God ever created. Um, and we put, we put ourselves in these places to where there are a very clear line of requirements for being supported and we just walk in the other direction. Um, so it, it does, for the individuals who uh, are the torch carriers with internally inside of an actual company that uh, actually want to support us and be there for us, that come from, that come from a place of, uh, of love, oftentimes we make it very difficult for us to choose, to be chosen as the individual support. Um, my six, none of my products that I've ever created are original. None of them, not even, not a single one. My focus is always being the best. And that's where my success comes from. And I, I have not built the success of any of my companies by myself. I am on the back of a lot of folks. So I tell people, like, hey, if I have an opportunity, you got an opportunity. Come and use me while I have this power. Please use me. Because I don't know how long I'm going to have it. So for me, I don't, so like when folks come to me with like business ideas, that's usually what folks ask me about. It's like, hey, can you give me some business ideas? I'm like, hey, 
I'm always here to give you the answer, the answer to your question. I just don't want to be on the brainstorming side. If you come put put come up with an idea, put it on paper, and I will teach you how to scale it. That's my single requirement. And there's so many times I tell people that, and I never hear from them again. I'm like, guys, I have a plethora of resources and access to, into a lot of rooms that have no value to me. I don't care about them. I would love to give them to individuals that can benefit from them. This is all I need so that when I go and uh, – I act like I'm your best friend to, to, rep to represent you. I need all the facts so I can drive you through the room. I'm going to pat you on the butt and say, hey, go be great. Bring somebody else uh, along with it. I just need these simple requirements. But it's day after day. I have, I have 1,600 unread text messages in my phone, y'all. And it, I, I don't miss anything. They all hit my watch. It just be so many times where I have an idea. I'm like, all right, flush it out. Call me as soon as you know what you want to do, and I'm going to tell you how to make it work. And I never hear from you again. Day and night. There are people in this room that, that I pulled aside. I'm like, hey, y'all, uh, you, you're going to be great. You're going to be phenomenal, <coughs> and I got you. I'm here, to do, I'm here to do this for you, and I'm here to help you out. Let me help you. And I never hear from her again. Hmm. That, that was a not-so-subtle flex, by the way. 1,600 yeah. unread text messages. It's stressful, y'all. It There's two types of people, y'all. And... <laughs> no, go for it, please. <laughs> I'm thinking about how I was going to answer the question, but now I, I want to continue this line of thinking. So <laughs> there are a couple of different kinds of people when it comes to business or just success in whatever industry you're in. And some of them want to get things done and others don't even want to show up for themselves. So I'll say right now, I'm clearly very blessed, had lots of opportunities and privilege to get to where I'm at. Um, two of my three sisters are in the room, um, you know, extremely experienced and educated. I get where we're sitting. There are people directly opposite from us, like Abdul was saying, and they're like, the white man is holding me down. Are they, are you just lazy? Are you just not pursuing the opportunities that you've been given? Did Abdul come talk to you and you never hit him back up? And so I feel like that happens a lot. Now, I'm not going to speak on every race of people. I'm talking about when people come to me, and Dr. AP, I'm sure they come to you as well because they're like, oh, you have a PhD, you've done some things, blah, blah, blah. Not to say the education is everything because it's not going to make you successful. It's how you choose to utilize it. But people will come to me and ask me for advice, never follow up, or they don't want to do the work. They don't want to study. They don't want to get a certification, even if it's free. And I cannot for the life of me understand that. So would I want to bring up the people in, you know, in organization that are coming behind me? Sure. But I also have to know that you desire it as much as I desire it for you. And that doesn't always happen. So I, I remember there being, clearly I watch a lot of Issa Rae, you know, entertainment. This is a safe space for that as well. But, you know, the character Molly, she sees another sister who is a younger associate in the law firm and she wants to mentor her and trying to, you know, tell her how to navigate the waters. And to be fair, I've been both of those people in an organization. Um, but sis wasn't trying to hear Molly. She wasn't trying to hear like, okay, maybe you don't want to present yourself this way if you're trying to be successful in this environment, which is condoning code switching. These days I'm gonna show up with my very natural hair um, before I would slick it down in a bun so people wouldn't be alarmed at my presence. But I don't care if I'm wearing, you know, my sister locks now or before when I was wearing my huge, what my dad called my Diana Ross Shaka Khan hair. And I'm walking into the office and all that is me. And I think what that is, is valuing your authenticity um, and also being able to be vulnerable and not afraid of the consequences of that. Like your blackness is not bad. Your hair is not bad. The fact that you talk a little louder than some people or quieter than some people, the slang you may use is different. Okay. And as long as you're on top of your stuff, as long as you're doing your work, you follow up with people, you're trying to make progress. That's the important stuff here. So like you said, we're getting in our own way. Yeah. A lot of people are, it's not just black people, but I'm talking about our people right now. One of my very good friends is a pilot. He's been a captain at multiple airlines and he flies the largest plane that you could possibly fly now. He's the face of an airline he doesn't even work for anymore. 
And so many black kids from Kansas City will hit him up like, I want to be a pilot. He talks to them one time. Not a one of those men or women have come back to him. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? So I'm asking y'all now, what are y'all doing to keep yourself from making progress in this industry? Not what is somebody doing to hold you back? Yes, all of these systems have been created to oppress us and hold us in a certain space. But what are you doing? What, where's your accountability for what's going on? Sorry. That's good. Um, I think to answer the question, internalized racism is such a big barrier and what can we do? Um, what's the solution? So I think one of my heroes, maybe Dick Gregory or James Baldwin said that if we have to ask to be accepted, then we are a group of people who don't know who we are. Um, so I go back to what did my ancestors say about me? So if you, and Lexi's heard me say this, a lot of people have heard me say this, but if you look at almost every pyramid and temple in ancient Kemet, modern day Egypt now, it's inscribed know thyself on the top of it. So that was such an important concept for our ancestors. Um, the understanding of who we are. And I think that that is where the solution lies because anyone can um, can have the false notion of white supremacy develop within them, right? They can look exactly like me. If you turn on the television at age four, you're being indoctrinated into the notion of, of, of this false ideology of, of white supremacy. So I think that that's the, the important thing and that's where it starts. I would recommend that everyone go on a journey of ridding themselves, the ideology that they possess, how they view themselves, how they view the world, um, to go on a journey of ridding that false notion of white supremacy from their lives because it is ingrained in everything. And then to seek out on a journey of knowing yourself, discovering who you are. Who did your ancestors say that you are? And do that self-discovery work so that we won't have these internalized uh, notions of, 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 of white supremacy within ourselves and that we don't... Um, erroneously take upon these stereotypes that we're lazy or that we're unproductive. But what's going on in their lives? What, what elements of discrimination? Remember, it's five a day. So what, what happened to that individual who didn't call you back or who didn't follow through? Like what's going on in their lives? And I think that that's like really the important um, part that we need to, to, to really examine. And it's a self-discovery, right? It, it's a ridding ourselves of this, um, atrocious element that en encapsulates all of America, right? It encapsulates um, the globe for the most part, but how can we identify that within ourselves, rid ourselves from it, and then go on a journey of figuring out who we are? Because if, if we're begging for acceptance, then we are people that lack identity, and that that is the problem. I like what y'all be having to say. <laughs> um, Maybe to just to wrap up here, because that was my final question. But um, I think a lot of what you guys kind of are um, addressing just from that last question is um, to me, it sounds like fear, um, fear of oneself, fear of achieving a certain status, fear of actually having to like go through the process. I feel like there's a lot of people who feel like they don't deserve to be in the sp in, in high places. So they kind of talk themselves out of it. Um, not saying that it's okay um because it still is complacency at the end of the day but i feel like that self-sabotaging like seeing that voice in your head that's telling you like i i don't know if i could do this like i don't know if this is for me um comes with for one like you said knowing yourself um i feel like a lot of people um are developing their identity kind of a little bit later in life these days just because of the socialization of survival <laughs> survival literally just that so um I do think a lot of that is fear, um, fear of success, fear of knowing who you are, knowing what your path is. Um, a lot of um, herd mentality of like, oh, I can't really stand out. Um, I hate to quote SZA in this moment, but she said it best. Like, you know, the only thing holding you back is like, you know, your fear of looking stupid. And I feel like um, <laughs> that that speaks to a lot just being as a an outcast kind of growing up and kind of like being on the outside looking in or even when I was inside just not really even like knowing what was happening like you know I I had to get over that fear of standing out and getting over that fear of like ooh 
see that don't make sense to me i know that a lot of y'all are doing this but that don't make sense to me or like i know that a lot of people are going this way or going to this school or doing that doing this and doing that but that doesn't that doesn't resonate with me which goes back to my saying that black people are not a monolith like just because um group think happens in places like in my opinion kansas city like group think is very strong very very strong here if you are a person who aspires to do anything outside of the norm you will get persecuted from left and right from your own people from people outside of your people um all of the above right so um i think what we could do to combat some of that is things that we're doing right now, like having these conversations, creating the spaces for people to come together and provide those resources and make the resources look realistic in that way. If that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think when you, when you see people doing things like that are great and you see, and you don't resonate with them, like you don't see yourself doing these things, you don't identify with these people. Um, I, I think it's like a self-esteem issue. You know what I'm saying? You kind of like internalize that you are not capable of doing these things too. It's that same concept of only one person, especially in Kansas City, only one person can do this. Nobody else can do this. If, if, if one, only one person can have a bookstore, only one person can sell flowers, only one person can be a photographer, only one person can have all of the, you know, only one person can be successful at this. And should I decide to, um, to take this on, I fear that the people who are in this space do are you know do will not make space for me to succeed as well. So I do think that that could be a part of it as well, just with that um, fear of following through. Um, but I just wanted to say that in just um, in the space of conversation for what you guys were saying. But in the name of wrapping things up, semi on time. I want to say thank you guys for coming out here today. Shout out to the Keystone Collab. Shout out to BXKC. Shout out to Craig, who just got back from Greece. Hope he bought me some G some Euros. Uh, all of the things. Thank you for our panelists for showing up here um, authentically yourselves and from speaking from a, a, a beautiful place and um, really providing some perspective on some of these things. And uh, yeah, that is a wrap. <laughs>